covariative correction. Um, let's take our training set again, right? So cats and dogs. And well, what could possibly go wrong? OK, so we build our classifier. Um, it's our test set. Right. And of course, this doesn't work at all, right? right? Because it doesn't recognize that kind of cats. Um, and so you think, well, you know, this is like obvious. Why would anybody do this? You know, why could, how could you possibly be so naive? Um, well, here's a couple of examples. So in web search, let's say you want to build a search engine, and maybe you have some page relevance data for the United States market. But now you decide, OK, well, my search engine is getting really popular in Canada and the UK and Australia and so on as well. Not even talking about you know, countries with different language, but even you know, all markets that speak English. Um, you know, the search relevance may not be the same. So for instance, you, know, you would imagine that Canadians are maybe more polite, care more about bears and the queen, and maybe then you know, the Royal Mounted Police, right? And so you can clearly see that you know, the search results ought to be slightly different. Or in speech recognition, let's say I train this thing with a West Coast accent, and then I want to deploy this, and I deploy it, let's say, in, in Texas, right? Or worse, I deploy it on people like me who don't speak native English, right? And then the, spe the, you know, the speech recognizer fails. I guess most of us probably had that problem at some point where you called some hotline and they told you cheerfully, hey, this is the new voice operated system. And you started getting really mad at that voice operated system because it wouldn't understand you, right? And that's covariate shift. Because the reference distribution that the system was trained on wasn't trained on people like most of us here in this room. Or even things have different names, the same thing. So, um, you know, a soda is called a pop or a Coke or other things, and that differs even within the same country. So here's a distribution of names for soft drinks, right? And so different parts of the United States, and it's a red and blue divide that's different from the usual one that you would have seen. Um, yeah, people call things pop and Coke and soda. Right, obviously, you know, near Atlanta, they call it Coke because, well, you know, Coke is there. But nonetheless, there's, uh, there's quite some variety. So even if you build a voice recognition system, and you, let's say you build it in California, and then because you have another research lab in Boston, Massachusetts, and then your system will work very well if for things called a soda, right? But they won't work for the rest. Um, so this is kind of funny. Um, well, these are not so funny things. Um, so the first one is something that actually happened. Um, let's say you're a medical startup. And you want to design a blood test to find out whether uh, you know, somebody has prostate cancer. And it turns out it's fairly easy to get blood samples from sick old men. To, because they're, you know, they're sick and they say, hey, look, if you can find a blood test to you know, detect this earlier, well, you know, that's really good. So sick people are usually very willing to donate you know, their blood, right? Um, and then they figure, realized, well, OK, we have this tiny little issue. We don't have enough data from healthy men. And that actually has some ethics quandaries, because you know, if you just you know, sample blood and you find out, well, this person might be sick, but you don't know whether you should try to, you know, trust your test. So do you call this guy up and you know, scare the heck out of him and say, hey, look, our test said that you might have cancer, but we're not sure. Um, on the other hand, well, do I shut up and let this guy maybe die? Right? So it's not easy to get that data, long story short. They had this brilliant idea of, because they were on a university campus, and students are a cheap bunch. And for, I guess, a free beer, they are willing to de donate a small amount of blood. So they got a lot of this blood and got it analyzed. And then they came to me and said, Alex, can you help us build a classifier? 
Uh, and I told him, yes, I could, and it would probably work really perfectly, and it would be perfectly useless. Because, well, their healthy population were essentially men in their 20s who probably work up more and drink more and are university students and stuff like that. And the other, the sick distribution are old men with prostate cancer, and a classifier of old against young would work really well, right? So this is covariate shift that, well, basically, they blew their last available cash on this, and that was the end of that startup. Mind you, it was run by a couple of university professors, but not statisticians. Um, another case, reinforcement learning. Let's say I train on data gathered with you know, the current policy, and then you know, my policy changes because you know, I'm getting better at playing StarCraft or slaying monsters or controlling the AC system in my, in my server center. And so now, at test time, well, because the environment responds to that, well, you know, maybe my algorithms don't work so well anymore. There's a lot of interesting work about replay buffers, on and off policy learning, and propensity scoring there. So take a class of, I guess, Peter Abiel or Sergey Levin, and you know, you'll get a lot more of this. And then there's things like, for instance, databases. So let's say we build a self-learning database, self-tuning database. And this is tuned on you know, 2017 usage patterns, and then you deploy it. And you deploy it, oops, I should have probably updated it to 2019, but if I deploy it in 2018, then 2017 pattern might still be subtly different, so my algorithms will no longer be optimal. Long story short, covariate shift is real, and it's pretty much by default assumed that you have a problem of that kind. So let's look at the math. So the training risk, and right now I'm assuming I have you know, infinite amounts of data, so let's not worry about that rather so much, but I basically minimize the integral dx p of x, dy p of y given x of some loss, right? But at test time, and I'm assuming that p of y given x, so you know, what the correct label is for given data, that doesn't change between training and test time. So for instance, talking about you know, sick men, well, they are sick regardless, right? But I just have a lot more of one kind than the other. Um, so at test time, I don't have the integral dp anymore, but I have an integral dq. And so what I really should have done is I should have minimized an empirical risk relative to data drawn from the q distribution. But obviously, I don't have the labels for about test time. So what I can do is, it's actually very simple, dx q of x f of x, I can write it as dx p of x, and then I have q of x over p of x times f of x. So I have basically that ratio q over p. Now, if you've taken a measure theory class, you'll probably hate me for putting this equation up because what you'd really need is the rather Nicodem derivative dq dp, but we are not going to worry about those details here. So if you are so inclined and you've done measure theory, uh, yeah, there's a cleaner way of writing it, but just for now, let's just look at that. And so the problem is now you need that density ratio. And one way of going about it is, well, I estimate P, I estimate Q, then I take that ratio, and then it doesn't go so well, right? Because density estimation is really, really, really hard. Um, don't do that. Instead, it turns out that getting the ratio of those two densities is much easier to obtain. And I'll show you how to do this, and you'll actually do that in your homework in detail.